We've worked with $50 billion a year companies and they still need coaching. The biggest travel for me has been from Indonesia all the way to New York to meet Justin Welsh. Uh, I wanted to go on and play a professional sport. I played a rugby. I dislocated my kneecap, tore my cruciate, oh. finished forever. I guarantee you when you started your entrepreneurship journey, you were just like, oh, if you could, if I could just make like $2,000 a month, yeah. but then you make the first 2,000, you're like, maybe I could double it. If I can get to 100K a month, if I could get to a mil a month. By so many entrepreneurs get hooked by like crazy adventures. Life has become too easy for people right now. You're not gonna die. You're not gonna end up on the street. The following is a conversation with Darren Lee. He's an international entrepreneur, he's a world traveler, and he's a one of the best podcast hosts in the world right now, especially when it comes to business and entrepreneurship. He's generated over 50 million views, over 30 shows, and he's the founder of Voix. Without any further ado, we will be talking about, of course, podcasting, the trials and tribulations of entrepreneurships, his background as an athlete, as well as rescuing dogs, one of the most interesting things I've ever had here on a podcast. So without any further ado, let's crack right into it. All right, Darren, so here's this interesting part about you. So you you come from the finance background, you just completely quit that, like the classic hero story, so to speak. And <laughs> now you're, now you're a, a very successful podcast host, your business owner. What made you go into the podcast direction? Like why podcast as the medium? Take a step back, right? When we are young, dumb, and we try to do multiple different things, we try different shit, right? We try drop shipping, we try affiliate marketing, we try coaching, we try multiple different stuff. And I had done a lot of that stuff, right? Mm. And as a result, I was yielding zero to no results. But it wasn't a problem with the vehicle, right? As you know, in your business, everything works. It all works. The mm. problem is usually with the entrepreneur. It's usually with the founder. It's usually with the individual who screws it up, who gets it wrong, who can't, who, who doesn't have the skills, the internal skills, right? And after, in my early days, at 19 years old, running raves, running parties, at 20, I was in crypto. At 21, I was dropshipping. At 22, I was building an app. I was building a passport app, man, in, in 22. And then shut the whole thing down. And I was a like, gap. Yeah, maybe it could be me. So the whole idea was to spin it from, what can I take? the more so what can I give? Now, mm. at 22, I don't have much to give, right? Of mm. course I don't, but I know that other people do. I know that other people want to share the message. And these same lessons that I was having at dinner tables with people, I knew other people wanted to have. And it was really my own search for direction, search for fulfillment, was really understanding what I wanted to do in my life. And the irony was when I started it, I was like, no one's going to listen. No one's going to care. Who gives a shit about this young person? But all the messages from episode one, episode two, episode three, Everyone said the same thing. They felt the exact same way. They felt unfulfilled. They had no purpose. They had no drive. They really didn't know what they wanted to do with their life. And it's a common thing that mostly men don't talk about. Because, you know, you look, you jump, you jump on Twitter, everyone has it figured out. You go on Instagram, YouTube, everyone has it figured out, right? You're looking at Luke Belmar, you're looking at Jordan Welsh, you're looking at all these guys. But underlying it is usually a lot of change, a lot of anxiety, a lot of trouble. And that's where I was. So it would only took me many, many months to basically figure out not only a process for myself, but also a way to even be able to interact with people. Mm -hmm. And we started out, you know, zero to one, very vanilla podcast, and then started iterating, transforming it more and more into more online business, more into un entrepreneurship, into a journey of self-discovery. That's what it's been about for me, right? And unlike chasing profit, which can sometimes end up with zero, I wanted to chase purpose. And I felt like that this entrepreneurship online business space is really a journey of figuring out what you want to do and being able to put those steps in base so that not only can you help yourself, but you can help other people in the process. Damn. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's cool because <clears throat> it sounds to me like you were like, well, fuck it. Instead of just, you know, faking it, like I'm the guy who's got it all figured out. I'm just going to go down the route of like, how can I put myself in the, in the perspective of a learner? get cool podcast guests and kind of like that, like have people be part of that journey. Like that kind of like authenticity trumps everything. That, that's what 100%. it felt like. And, and that's also like, it's so funny because the way I found your stuff was I was just dicking around on YouTube. And then I found one of your podcasts. I, I forgot who it was, but the title was, I also forgot about that. Um, but I was like this, the title on the thumbnail was really cool. So I clicked on it and, and then I'm like, this is a really sick podcast. Like I like the setup visually. And I like the questions mm. that you asked and they weren't like fanboy, you know, like, like so many podcasts, mm. it's just like some guy interviewing some fanboy. 
but I felt like with you, you actually tried to have a, a decent conversation, which is fucking rare. Like, podcasts right now are everywhere everyone's trying to have a podcast but nobody really knows because it looks so easy it's like oh just sit down and have a conversation right <laughs> that's what everybody thinks like, i could have a conversation but 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 there, a lot of work goes in there and i really felt that with your podcast and then you had the promo thing of like hey podcast university i'm like oh i'll, fuck it, I'll buy it it's whatever i can't remember 200 bucks or something so i'm like yeah let me check it out and it was actually very very valuable and i'm like oh damn this is actually really, really freaking good. And I used what I really liked the most about it was the um, why me, why you, why now kind of framework when you're reaching out to people. And I used that. Uh, it was so funny. I have to tell you this. Um, I, I basically ran out of my initial uh, guest ideas because I got everybody on that I already kind of knew. And then I'm like, okay, shit, now this is it. Like, I don't know anybody else that I can get on. Here's a, a, li here's a list of people I would love to have on, but no way in hell they're going to say yes because they're all bigger than me. They're all, you know. Mm -hmm. So I literally, um, and then I bought your program and then I used that framework of reaching out. And within a weekend, every single one of them replied and said yes. Every single oh, one of them. Man. So I want to give you props here on, on, on this part here because I'm like, holy shit. And now I'm, I got like so many guests lined up, including you, because then I was like, okay, I want to have Darren on the podcast as well. Um, so in, in this regard, I'm happy you're here. So, um, now you're doing mostly a podcast in person. What is the furthest you've traveled for a single podcast? <laughs> Firstly, man, I want to say a big thank you for going through the program though and actually going through it in detail and actually using the frameworks, right? Because this is a big thing is the fact that most people will take the information, they'll buy the program and they'll never action a shit, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. How often do we see that, right? But I like to think that a lot of this is science. It's frameworks, it's tools, it's practices that you can use. You can hop in, use them today. I just had a call with all of our clients this morning going through the exact same framework. It's like, where do we start? What do we have right now? What, what's in our resources, right? What's within our resources? How can we capitalize on that to take the next step forward? It doesn't have to be do with podcasting. It can be do with anything in your business, content, so on. Now, you asked about the podcast, but where we've traveled furthest. The biggest travel for me has been from in Indonesia, all the way to New York to meet Justin Welsh. Justin Welsh is like someone that I've loved for a long time. He was really helping me go zero to one of my business. And he's like the OG solopreneur. And last year, I wanted to do this new path whereby, and I feel like in some ways we kind of paved, paved the way for this, whereby we wanted to do more stuff in person, but more tours, right? So we would fly somewhere, get something set up and really nail podcasts that are like international. And the reason for that is because you know, the world is so like dispersed, entrepreneurs are everywhere, but there's often not people coming together, right? So if I could bring people together in a podcast setting, I think it'd be pretty cool, right? Because we're pulling in different backgrounds because I'm based mm -hmm. in Indonesia, right? Flying to America is 11,500 miles away. God knows how many kilometers is it is, right? So my oh, thought process was, was that if we could pull something off like that and like really run this up, I mean, highest quality production we got a film crew that came in that mm. used to shoot um movies basically that came out of hollywood when hollywood would shoot movies in new york we had the same film crew that came set up did everything right and we thought okay this could be a pretty cool idea how about we go all the way across the world we bring in some of the biggest entrepreneurs in the world we had justin welsh we had sahel bloom we had louisa and nicola we had Ireland moore and in one week, we just hashed it all out. I was literally, I was spending maybe 14 days in the studio, 14 oh, hours man. in the studio, preparing, working from there, doing everything. And man, like that's what it's about. Like that actually is the fucking grind is the fact that you make that commitment. My family and friends were like, oh, like, what did you think of New York? I was like, I didn't fucking see you in New York. <laughs> I, didn't, man, I, I ordered fucking Uber Eats into the, into the place every single day. I had a gym in my hotel. And I went from the hotel oh, to the studio, hotel to the studio. And my partner couldn't even bring herself to get into the studio anymore. She was so fucking exhausted from it. So mm. that idea of going like across the world, I think it's, I don't think there's anyone else in the world that's doing it at that level, right? Like we're putting, you know, tens of thousands of dollars into these events and not to just do them, but because they increase like the surface area for a look, your probability to be able to grow your show, build your authority, build your influence is done by how much work you do in the back end. Mm -hmm. And it all started with our first tour, which we did in Dubai last year in May. So I was living in Singapore. Um, 
I was really kind of like done with the whole tech finance space. And I knew my podcast was growing. It, I was getting the murmurs, the tremors that things were moving the right way, the Sick. feedback from people. And people were coming in saying like, yeah, there's a point where it's going to take off. And I knew I was a couple of people that were bouncing around Dubai. It's kind of when Dubai kind of very known within the online business space. It's obviously been known for quite some time. Mm. And I said, you know what? We could go from Singapore to Dubai, rent out a studio for a week. And we had people like Sadia Khan, Justin Waller, who else we had with Adam Power in there as well. And that was our first real tour. Now we nailed that model. You know, the team did that. We nailed it all together. And I knew that this could be something that could be repeated and recycled and repeated and recycled with something that's fun every single time. And I think that's a big thing that people forget in this like content world or like the world of like online business in general is that it should be fun, right? It should be entertaining. We should be playing the game and like taking the seriousness out of it because the seriousness, seriousness happens when you're sitting at your table, when you're grinding the fuck out in the middle of fucking Helsinki, right? That's where the grind is. But apart from that, we should be trying to have fun, right? So I do think that we're going to do more of those in the future, whether it's going to be like Miami, San Francisco, London coming up um, and just blitz it, you know, and kind of create this repeatable process that, is going to be unique, is going to be hard to replicate, is going to be hard to copy because in the online space, right, it's not long before someone steals everything from under you to some degree. Mm, yeah. Now, you keep saying we. So when, when you travel, how many people do you travel with? Because you said in New York you had a crew there that you just kind of hired. Mm -hmm. How many yeah. people are involved usually like as the core team that you travel with? So we have... Um, the studio that we have that we put together, right? So generally in that studio, we're going to need a we're going to need a group of people. So that can that's going to be hired locally, right? Yeah, and that's going to be done through, um, like a production team, w w which we'll have in the end. And then there's also the team that we have within our company within Voix, right? Is that a lot of people will claim that they're these solopreneurs and stuff, but my company has always had a very strong foundations, right? We have a COO in the company, mm -hmm. we have multiple editors, multiple designers, uh, creative people. And if it wasn't for all of us playing our roles, like I'm recording a podcast, but that has nothing to do with it, right? It's all about how it all feeds in together. Like that's basically what makes these things excel, right? Mm. When we're running, when they get through, these guys are running the company, well, I'm fucking on planes everywhere. That's part of the process, right? And I mean, sometimes there's not enough light shone on that sometimes. The fact that other people are there as well to help you in that journey. Mm. And even things like on the peripheral, like even my partner, huge uh, help in, in what I do. You know, I think I wouldn't be able to do half the stuff if it wasn't for her support. And there are some things I think that uh, we need to kind of raise more, raise more awareness to. Mm. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I feel like this, because I also watched a podcast with, with, with Welsh, um, the whole solopreneur thing, it sounds so sexy to a lot of people nowadays because it's, it kind of paints the picture of like less responsibility. It's like, oh, you don't have a team, so you don't mm -hmm. need to hire, you don't need to manage, you don't have to, you know, like figure out other people. Um, it's very much the same in my business too. It's like, I'm not a solopreneur. I have a huge team and I, mm -hmm. I pay off a lot of my profits to that team. And mm -hmm. it does call it, it you have to really really grow and become better with people i always say like this is like 100 percent up to like 50k a month you'll be fine just doing it yourself and then beyond that the predominant skill level that actually helps you make the best out of your business is people skills and that was that that was really difficult for me because i'm a natural introvert i uh i think i'm probably slightly on an autistic frame somewhere like on the spectrum Cause it's really hard to some, like relating to people. Like my, I talked to this about my, I talked about this with my girlfriend the other day. She's like, I have a feeling like it takes you a lot of effort to like empathize and understand other people. And I'm like, it does. I'm like, I have same, to same. Yeah. I'm the exact same. I'm the exact same. No, but I, I completely agree with you though. As in, so I think that it's, again, it's always like, it depends, right? With the solopreneur mm. area is that it's more of a lifestyle business. You're not, you're not looking for scale. Right. And, Something like Justin, highly respect, so on. But he's at a different stage in his life. He's around 44, 45 years old. Mm. He grew two unicorn companies at an early stage wow. employee, right? So he's at the point where he's like, you know what? Fuck it. I don't want to do cold plunge. I don't want to do sauna. I want to have a beer on a Friday. And I'm like, you know what, dude? Go ahead. But me, who's 28, just turned 20, just turned 28, we're much more in this like world domination phase, as, as I described it. As yeah. that. We want to mm. do as much as possible. And we almost want to achieve our potential right I, I almost feel if i stayed very very small with our company that i would go in circles and to be honest the business would start declining right because i wouldn't be putting my best foot forward but where we are in the business now is that we've gone to 
I think we're at seven full time now. Uh, just shy of like a million runway, a million in annual recurring revenue. Um, highly profitable, like very good margins, very healthy business, good team, good clients. But again, I wouldn't have got to that point if it wasn't for the team. Team, right and this was the whole thing is that people like tim stoddard uh a huge influence on me he, he runs copy blogger he's at agency for 13 years he was like you're the fucking bottleneck you're the, like the entrepreneur is the bottleneck in the business but if you do not want to hire there just comes limitations and pros and cons mm -hmm. unless you could have a coaching program or which you you know you, you specialize in or you have info products that you can kind of elastic scale up and down you know it's going to be kind of it's less like a um a continuous business whereas in contrast you know we have a, a customer experience manager operations manager we have year-long contracts that's what we're building though like that mm -hmm. was the intent with the build uh and of course like there's pros and cons to that i feel like that a lot of client facing companies um they reach a big cap you know sometimes getting to that two to three mil a year is awfully it's near, nearly more painful than anything else at that point you're nearly you're nearly better off uh developing like some boutique software around what you do or adding in a coaching element which is what you do of course um so different stages but also different stages for where you were in your life right and i think um you made a really good point in the beginning i want to go back to is that you said that i was always like the learner right and that came from years thinking that I was the shit, thinking that I was the man, right? I had led a face of being this ego, like I know what I'm doing. I have it all figured out, right? And the more you have it figured out, the more you're going fucking nowhere, right? And that's the same in business too. It was when I swapped from being the guru back to the student and just stayed with the student mentality, allowed me to build a better team, to build a better product, to serve more clients, to be of service to my partner, to be of service to me, uh, and just to show up as a better human every day. But most people will switch from student to guru, proclaim they know everything, and then start moving backwards. They're not mm -hmm. going to show you the screenshots on Twitter when they start regressing and they lose all their money, right? Mm -hmm. But they're going to hold on to that guru status. And one of the reasons why people hold on to the guru status is they're actually just helping people who are zero go to one, right? They're helping people make like their first $1,000 online but they need to have a perceived level of status and authority and influence, mm. which is why they take on this guru status a lot of time. And the result of that is it's like a shaky bridge, right? It's like you build the wrong foundations and you have to re regress and go backwards. So that's kind of how I, how I think about it. A lot of people are different, of course, but I think it's something to be very mindful of, especially in the online business space. Yeah, it, it was a lesson that I learned pretty early on with, with my first business in the dating advice, personal development business, because um, I was also very young. I was, I was 23, 24. And the first year or so of my brand, I thought like I need to be the perfect dating coach that never gets rejected. Like my game needs mm -hmm. to be impeccable. And I knew it fucking wasn't right. Like who, like nobody has the perfect game, so to speak. Um, but I tried to have that fake mask on. I would try to have that fake persona that I am perfect. And then what it actually did is it cost me so much energy physically and mentally to maintain that persona that mm. it really fucked with me and it, it took away the whole, all the whole, all the joy behind that business. And then I remember I, I made a video where I said, okay, I want to talk about rejection and I want to talk about my personal rejections and I want to show me getting rejected. And I was so scared about publishing that video. I remember I, I, I was hovering with the, 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 the index finger above the publish button. And I'm like, this is going to ruin my brand forever. And then, you know, I went to sleep after publishing it. And the next morning, I got all this really, really great feedback from guys saying, Max, I never resonated with your brand until I saw that video. Because now I can see you're human. Now I can see you're, you're struggling with, with everything else. And you don't try to up, up, uphold that, that fake guru persona, like you said. And, and, and it's really wonderful because not only did it help me personally, because I didn't need to invest energy into upholding a, a fakeness that I'm not, I could just be myself. But at the same time, people resonate more with it, which is perfect. Sure. And, and, I lo and I love that you brought that up because I feel like it, that's gotten even worse, that fake persona in a world of, of fake Instagram influencers and all that jazz. And everybody mm -hmm. drives around with rented Lambos that people are, they're so massively craving that authenticity that like, okay, well, this guy, 
is open about his shortcomings. This guy doesn't just post, you know, the revenue, but he also talks about the profit margins and so on and so forth. Mm. Man, and, and uh, the reason why that's so important to me and the reason why I think people go fucking AWOL with it in the wrong direction is because if they lose frame, then they won't get the business. That's their perspective. Mm, mm. Whereas for me, obviously we've like Podcast University, but ultimately I don't have a product selling to to uh, my followers, right? I don't really have a product that we market to every single day. So I can tell you that entrepreneurship is hard. I can tell yeah. you that podcasting is hard. I can tell you that fitness is hard. I can tell you that staying on shape and doing 16 hour days is rough as fuck. And it's not for most people because I'm not trying to sell you anything. So if I had something to sell, I'd have to make the perceived likelihood of achievement easier i'd have to showcase the desired outcome easier i'd have to showcase the effort and the implications that are going to be yep. uh, shown much easier it's going to be a lot easier to achieve this whereas because i'm just me recording my podcast and our business is a b2b podcast over here doing other stuff allows me to just have flexibility yep. engage my audience help younger people and the amount of people similar to yourself i can imagine the amount of people that would message me that are 16 17 18 that are getting their first rung up on the ladder and they're just doing their first business who are in their mid twenties and they spent the last five years drinking and their friends were mm. pulling them away. And now they stopped drinking as a result because I don't have any backhand offer. Now, if people want to work in the company, they can. And if they drop 60 K to work with us for the year. So as a result, it's like, chill, no pressure on you, bro. No pressure on me, bro. Mm. Let's just like learn together. Right. And I'd like to even get your thoughts on this, man, because I know you help people, uh, you know, like become coaches or help people in the coaching space. Would you, would you say that like people need to take need to have that expert frame? But what would you say if they don't have the frame going into it? They're not an expert in something. Yeah, there, there's this cringy kind of quote by by Gary Vee, but it still holds up to this day. And it's this whole idea of document, not create. And I tell this to mm -hmm. I and, and and just to touch back on what you said earlier, like by me, I used to promote my freedom business mentoring programs as like, oh, it's easy. What I do now mm -hmm. is and because and we did this for the first two years and then we switched because we realized like the more we said it's easy, the more immature the audience would be that we would attract as clients. And sure. sure, I want to give everybody a chance to make it. But then at the same time, if they come in with the expectation of it, will it will be easy. And then inevitably it won't be easy because entrepreneurship is fucking hard. They get that expectation broken and then they give up, which of course also looks bad on us because we're like, well, all these people are giving up. They're not even going through the whole program, no matter how much we try to hold them accountable. And then we switch to like, hey, it is fucking hard. Let's be honest. But at the same time, it's one of the best business models out there because you're not just making money. You also have an impact. It's crisis proof and so on and so forth, which is very, very true. Plus, we're managing expectations properly. So the people that come in there now, they're much more experienced, uh, usually in their field. They're a little bit more mature because they're not so triggered by hype and easy and Lambos. They're more like they're, they associate more with hard work. And I know it takes long and, and you know, uh patience so to get back to your question whenever clients come to us and they say hey um but i'm not a 10 out of 10 expert yet i usually say like first of all who the fuck is ever mm. right second of all how the hell are you going to get good at something unless you do it so you want to be experienced as a coach well then go start coaching people because you're not going to be better as a coach just by reading more about your expertise because coaching is kind of like a, a two-pronged sword. It's a, a, a two-sided sword. On one side of the sword is actually your expertise. How much do you know about nutrition, about fitness, about dating, whatever it is. But then it's also how much do you know about passing that knowledge on? And that is very underestimated because uh, there's a lot of geniuses out there that are a genius at their field, but they don't know how to communicate their ideas, mm -hmm. their concepts to someone that isn't there. It's a whole skill set mm -hmm. that needs to be uh, accumulated. So I would always say, well, go start coaching because that skill set needs to be needs to be worked on anyways. And if you're not super confident to charge high ticket prices, get a freaking test client for free. Get for three sure, test man. clients for free. Charge them 500 bucks. Just charge slower. I mean, I'm sure you guys didn't start at 60K a year either. You probably did it mm. for free at some point to some level to someone. And then you just worked yourself up like that. Man, you know what's interesting there is the fact that everything is coaching everything is strategy and everything mm -hmm. is how you can help people so let me walk through it right so for people context my business is a it's a podcast business we run entrepreneurs podcasts keep it simple we did the execution stuff for quite some time what i which i would describe as the commodity side of the business we yeah. edit your podcast we produce your podcast we manage it we grow it da, 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 da. we manage on a day-to-day -day basis and that was fine that got us to a six-figure business da, 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 whatever however what got us 
to a seven figure business and what what will potentially even get us an eight figure business is the seven figure is the coaching. It's me sitting down, doing a weekly check in with people, going through their work, looking at where they can improve, looking at where they should go wrong, where are they going off the strategy, da, 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 making sure that everything is nailed. And then doing like a monthly deep dive, where, which we have in the morning at six o'clock in the morning, where we go super deep into people's work, the data, the performance, why it's getting better, why it's not better. This is important for two reasons. One, they get better. Two, you get better. And then actually a third reason, it increases engagement. It increases the likelihood of success and that they actually want to do this for the long run. And the last aspect then that we've kind of added on, which has really blown up the business recently, is helping them with the offer. Is because mm. not only is it about your content, right? You can have the best content in the world, like Mr. Beast or whatever, but if you don't have a proper <clears> offer on the back end or you don't have a way to monetize, whether it's coaching, sponsorships, revenue, um, sorry, uh, um, service delivery, if it's if there's not something in the back end, it's kind of all for nothing. That's the way I describe it. If there's no way for people to continue and learn with you. So I think that evolution has come from me recording podcasts, me helping people record podcasts, me mm. doing the actual work for them, and then realizing, okay, wait, we need to add in more. We need to be more on their heels, follow them up, customer experience, be it a close touch point. And look, you know, we work with some people that we've worked with $50 billion a year companies like literally top 1% companies in the world and they still need coaching. That's the, that's the mm, irony yep. is because what you think that you, what you, what is um, the curse of granted knowledge is basically what you know in your brain. You think that everybody knows it. So whether that is like teaching someone or whatever, but you'll be surprised the amount of CEOs I get on, get on calls with. And I walk through the most <laughs> basic shit ever, but I don't, I don't look at it as the basics. I just look at it as the fundamentals and, you know, I don't talk about hacks and the growth hacks and all this shit. I focus on the fundamentals and it's funny how that has an adjacent benefit on your life. It, imp it improves your communication, your empathy, your sympathy, your, your way you interact with people and how you even hold yourself up. Right. So yeah. I think, yeah, any sort of element that you can coach people with is always a great idea. Yeah. It's funny. It, it's almost like the, we are at this like funny point in time where you know young chaps like us we have this kind of like unfair advantage of like having grown up with technology and uh, you know so you, like you said like you got these 50 billion dollar year companies that are usually run by guys in their 50s 60s 70s for them like the internet is like a magical thing they have no clue how it works so you you go there and you're like hey like social media check this out like you post this video and now it got like 10,000 views they're mind blown they're like, how does this work? And you and you did this on your phone. So, and it's cool. It's a very specific point in time, if you think about it, where you got guys that are so much further ahead of, of us in, in like the classical business sense, but we still yeah. have that edge over them where we can reach out and we can be of value to them because we just grew up with fucking Facebook and whatnot. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that, that's beautiful, you know? Um, one thing, one thing uh, I wanted to ask you earlier about, about the traveling parts is like, when you, re when you, when you go somewhere, you do these podcasts in person, do you, do you, st I guess you probably like grab some steak or something like that after the podcast with a person that that's been on, on, has that ever happened that you're like, the podcast itself is great, but then you grab steak with them and you continue to have a really awesome conversation and you're kind of like, damn it, I wish we record that as well. Yeah, man. There, there's also, there's that element for multiple reasons. It's because like, no matter where you are, no matter how experienced you are, when you hit record, things slightly change. Just yeah, exactly. Ever so slightly, ever so slightly, slightly change. And if it's not on you, it's on them. And if it's not on them, it's on you, right? So there is that element of it. But we record some stuff like B-roll, uh, whether it's like in like a restaurant or whatever. And it's been very, very effective, right? And I do think that there is that element too of, the relaxed version of podcasts. Now, I'd love if we've done this in person. We'll do the next one definitely in person for sure. Mm. But there comes something special from being in person anyway. But it's trying to emulate a non-fake like fake scenario. And fake can yeah. just be in a studio, right? But people react differently when cameras are on, when mics are on, right? So I think it's about taking that level of... That's on the host, right? That's on the host to bring down the room decompress the room so that it's almost more natural and then afterwards then everything that comes from it is an advantage but i do think there is a an overemphasis on like just getting the episodes done and just getting them out and whatnot i think there should be more time placed on the interaction before after and even just how you nurture relationships right because as we know that like the more 
the more you get into like the online business space, it's more about like what you've done, how you showcase your experience and how you help other people, which I think most people aren't focused on. They're focused on the quick grab, getting the clients and then trying to offload everything else to someone else, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, you mentioned that, that you're trying to generate a natural environment. And this is something I always try to do, like same with us, right? You, we just hopped into Zoom and I'm like, yo, let's start. That's kind of like my mm-hmm. antidote to awkwardness. I'm like, let's start right away so we can kind of ride that wave of like, hey, how's it going? Da, da, da. And just like, let's just naturally start it as soon as possible. What I do in mm-hmm. person a lot is I'm literally just like telling my crew to just already start recording, like as mm-hmm. we're sitting down, getting started, because then I want to avoid this like, all right, is everybody ready? Are yeah, we rolling? man. That sure. I'm I'm, tr- I'm trying to like, and my guys, like my in-person team knows that pretty well. They just start rolling right away. And then 20 minutes in the conversation, sometimes the guest is like, oh, are we recording already? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's been going on for 20 minutes already. Um, that's how I've kind of figured out how to do it. How do you make your, your, your guests really comfortable? How do you create that environment? A really good question. I think it's done beforehand because I'll often pick a studio deliberately that even has like a setting that I can meet a guest beforehand, like mm. whether it's a small lobby area or like coffee beforehand and just try to share as much information before and just to get them to kind of relax because the what I'm trying to do always is that our videos are hyper optimized towards performance, right? The way we record, the way we run, and we've done a lot of analytics over the space of hundreds of episodes to make sure that every episode is optimized to some degree that we're hitting the ground running hard. So the, the work I need to do beforehand is mainly interacting with people, chilling them out, like telling some stories, relaxing. Mm. And then when we hit record, we're actually hitting the ground running hard. If you've ever seen some of my episodes with our first question, our first first question is meant to deliberately not throw the guest, but question it is hmm. to make talk, right? It is to make things that are talk provoking. How can we move straight away? And some people respond great to it. Some people respond just normal to it, right? But it's more of this is going to be something that's super fucking valuable versus just, you know, wish wash, surface level, up here, pie in the sky stuff. And the reason how this works, right, is because where I saw my involvement or my engagement get 10, 10 times better was when I started to live the character that I wanted to be, right? When I wanted mm. to fucking get on these podcasts and really solve problems for me and solve problems for people that were like me, you know, first time founders, people that were scaling, people that were super fucking obsessed with business and how could they grow more? So when I'm recording these episodes and when I meet people, it's not fake. It's, this is where I am. This is who I am. This is what we're doing. This is These are the questions that I have that are solving my problem and many other people. So unlike we get on podcasts and be like how to be a top one percent man fuck that bullshit we're getting straight into the detail of what it is we're trying to solve which could be a hard-hitting question right it could be something an insight from the guest from 2017 or 2018 or how he changes opinion on something uh, important and i think guests feel that and they feel like my energy and my i don't know almost sense of like reality right it's the fact that like i'm someone that's in that space um and that's a lot better than i can think of thousands of podcasts right that guys talk about business they don't have a fucking business why why would you talk about business without a business right that's like that's like me running a spanish podcast and not speaking <laughs> spanish it's like it's the exact same premise right we have these fucking gurus to talk about like how to make like 50k a month and none of them have ever had a business they're work they're working cozy fucking jobs they're getting paid once a month right they're doing this on the side without telling anyone that they actually just fucking work a nine to five and then they're trying to educate you educate you on business right and that's why their content will just not grow it's just not gonna grow that way whereas when you take someone who's in the fucking trenches every day who's just grinding out successful or not successful it doesn't matter you bought the fucking ticket and therefore the guest the audience fucking world would at least respect that and then you're gonna get you're gonna grow a lot more effectively as a result I mean, it's it's also like you said, it's like the, the fact that you're in the trenches and you're basically just asking questions that you yourself would find interesting. You're emulating your audience and, and, and the audience is like, that's a really good question. That's what I want to know. And I think that's the differentiating factor between podcasts that will be around five years from now and podcasts that will be mm-hmm. completely forgotten because right now everybody does podcasts because the, the, entry, the entry barrier is so low. It's like, yeah. like I've seen podcasts shot on fucking iPhones 
with like a, like an iPhone uh, Bluetooth microphone. So the, 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 the entry barrier is super low and people have a network and you can do them on Zoom and whatnot. Um, but they're going to be gone though, man, right? Like 90% exactly. of podcasts don't get to episode three. Of the 10% that are left, 90% don't get to episode 20. And the reason exactly. isn't due to a lack of ability. It's due to like a lack of understanding, right? It's mm. ignorance. It's arrogance. It's going back to the, the guru status once again. It's like, I can do this because that guy over there did it. And the reality is like, I'm less talented than you. I'm less intelligent than someone else, but I just fucking did it. That's the difference. Mm-hmm. It's like you just stick on the course, you do it. You watch the number increment and you stick in it. Now, you made a very good point about being interested or not interested. This is when everyone falls down because we can all start a mental health podcast tomorrow, right? But how much, how how interested are you going to be in it unless you study neuroscience, unless you have a lot of background in it, a lot of uh, personal experience, yeah. anecdotes, experiences, life, life experiences. You're not going to be around for long. So my thesis on this is, only do something that you can do a hundred reps of a hundred newsletters, a hmm. hundred podcasts, right? A hundred sessions in the gym, a hundred runs on the road, a hundred long swims, 100 long cycles. If you can't envision yourself doing a hundred reps of it, then don't fucking do it. Like you don't need to do more. We're caught in this like era whereby people want to do more. They want more businesses, more side hustles, more calls, more clients. The whole idea is that if you can't do it for one and you can't do it in a small case you're never going to be able to do it on a larger scale and this is when we see people you know spin up four different ideas they all crash and burn bear in mind i have one business one offer one podcast that's it there's there's nothing like there's nothing else outside of it uh i always take this from sam ovens i remember sam ovens saying two things he was like if you have two offers you're probably broke to some degree, right? Mm-hmm, and take mm-hmm. that as you like, right? And the other thing is, he was, he was like, if you put your phone number in your email, you're also broke because you just, <laughs> you are, you're, you're obviously not focused enough, right? You're not focused enough that you have to give people your I fucking phone number so that they can ring you for business. You I do not it. have a clue of what you're doing. And I, I just always think about this stuff, man. You know what I mean? I always think about this stuff. We get fucking ten calls booked in a week into our company. I, I decline. 70% of them. And the reason why is because I just know that these people are not in it for the long run. They're looking for the mm. hacks, they're looking for the tricks, and mm. we should only be following the fundamentals. Which, man, you do a great job, right? Like, I went through a lot of your work for quite some time, you know? Like, your business account, your personal account, your businesses, they're so Thanks, well designed in such a way that we have this, like, nice, like, loop and continuation of loop, right? And, like, the podcast is such a nice way to add that on top because you're already smashing different verticals. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate the kind words. Yeah, for, for me, the podcast was merely like, because this is like, I think this right now is like episode 252 or something. The what? first, two, yeah, because the first 200 episodes or 230 were, were just monologue. Just, you know, hey, quick 20 minute episodes where I would talk about like a small sliver, sliver, like, hey, today we talk about this. Tomorrow we talk about this kind of mindset part, whatever. And then I was like, hmm. I wonder if I could kind of build this in a thing that I, so that I, it allows me to, to hit up awesome people and talk to them. Mm-hmm. Like for me, it was just like, I wonder if there's a way to, to, to have an excuse to talk to cool people and learn from them. And then I just started inviting people that I honestly want to learn from. So instead of inviting them for dinner, I'd be like, can you come to my podcast? Which coincidentally, you will get a much higher yes response rate when you invite someone to podcast than for dinner. Because everybody sure. loves being interviewed and, and, you know, passing on their knowledge and stuff like that, as long as you do a somewhat decent job. So that's how I started doing it. And I'm like, oh, cool. And now I get to share this and, and it even helps my brand, like as a side note. But the primary thing for me was just to learn and, and talk to cool people. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you, um, all your shots, you, you mentioned them earlier, like in the studio, you got like a professional team and all that jazz. But then even like your home studio shots are really good. Do you have some sort of knowledge slash background in videography? Did you try to read yourself into that? Or how, how, how are you making them look so good? Man, it's all trial by fucking fire. There's no better way to learn than to go through <laughs> the pain and the agony. So I started out $60 microphone that I got off Amazon with a with a 30-day money back guarantee if it didn't work out. I was so I was so worried that things weren't going to work out i literally had an out i had my cope right Mm. and i had no microphone that was working properly i had no camera that was working properly i used a shitty fucking laptop camera at the time Mm. but the whole idea was proof of concept does the podcast thing work do we resonate with people just is what we're doing working 
Then from there, it was 1% better every single mm. day, which is like 37 times better a year. Now, how that works, right, is I first went to stapling my iPhone to the wall. That's my first camera. And then I, I upgraded to like a $6 fucking uh, tripod. And then I mm-hmm. connected it through Bluetooth. I was Bluetooth recording my camera into Skype, bear in mind, right? And I had literally no idea what I was doing, but I was building authority, I was building influence, I was building stories, I was building a framework. It wasn't until episode 50 that I was kind of finding my kind of feet at that point, whereby I was actually making money for my podcast. And I think back, right? It initially started with helping entrepreneurs or helping, sorry, people move through their career and like get promoted in their career because I was working in finance. Hmm. And people started reaching out who were early stage coming to university being like, hey, can you help me get a job in Goldman Sachs and these tech companies and stuff? And I was like, yeah, hmm. sure. Like I know how to do it. I have a framework. Let's start doing it. So I had an ad hoc coaching program when I was 25 teaching 23 year olds how to get into these companies and it was working. Hmm. So the first bit of money I made in around a thousand dollars, I bought a Sony camera no idea what I was doing, no background what I was doing. I hadn't a fucking clue, man. But the whole idea was, look what's working, look what's not working. Where am I? Where's the gap? Where are you currently? Where do you want to get to? Where's the gap in between? And how do we close the gap? So over time, you just slightly adjust things, slightly move things. And it's only until you do hundreds of fucking reps at it that you get better and better and better. And even with the with the, with the the cameraman, I didn't have a lens. I had a Sony camera without a lens. And then I had to use it without a lens and then i was like oh well it's not working as well and then i tried to use a few different variations and so on and then we started swapping it into studios so i would go into these really good studios i would sit down with the audio engineers for hours and be like oh like how come it's like this and how come the wire doesn't go like this and then they would Mm -hmm. tell me how it's fed into like a system and how the system works and i was just learning this kind of mental model mental blueprint basically of how things should be right Mm -hmm. and then it got to the point now whereby if I'm going somewhere, I can educate the studio being like, hey, we're going for this touch and feel. We want it to move and, and sound like this way. And not only that, we can do this for our clients whereby they can pop up in Dubai, London, Berlin, Paris, Sick. Lisbon, New York, and it's turnkey. We already have the frameworks of how we want the lights to look, how we want the mm-hmm. feelings to look, how we want the vibe to look. So people can come, get that get that kickoff session's feel, but then be able to implement it for themselves. And yeah, man, it's just going and going again and you sometimes you don't even know what it is right if you look at some of the lights we have here they're like very expensive lights very difficult to get to get right you know but you have to learn from other people and there's no real like hack and trick to it right it's just mainly by doing yourself because everyone is unique in this scenario and they're not really optimizing for themselves they're optimizing for well you should be optimizing for the, the audience right what do the audience want the most yeah <laughs> it's funny that you went, you know, that you you talked about the the trial and tribulations. Have you ever lost a podcast? Like it, like it turns out it was out of focus or some shit. Yeah, for sure. I've done a few things shit like that, which has been kind of annoying. The only time that I ever really blew things up was I had a really shit old laptop, and Daniel Crosby he wrote a few. He has a couple of really good books. He's really in an online space and in the personal finance space and 45 minutes into it the video on my camera everything just like combusted just blew up <laughs> oh, no. but i was i was on zoom at the time man that shows how long ago it was <laughs> and, and and zoom actually kept the recording so i was able to recover 40 minutes of the 40 of, of the hour-long podcast but oh, God. i always think back in those things right it's like they're it's just it's just you i would look back at that now and think like that would never happen you know what i mean like that would like never really happen in that scenario but of course like you wouldn't be where you were today if that, if that stuff doesn't happen. And what's mm-hmm. important there too is like looking at when things go wrong and also looking at your reaction from there. When I was younger, I would react like much more negatively and much kind of yeah. throw my hands up at, the, at this scenario. Whereas like when you're older, you realize that like problems are part of the process, right? Mm-hmm. That audio is meant to go down, video is meant to go down, the internet's meant to go out every once in a while and your business as well, right? Same things were happening in your business. You know, you get some feedback from a client, rubs you the wrong way. It's not about what they said. It's not about what happens, but what you do next. It's all about the reaction, mm-hmm. right? And that's kind of how I view a lot of things in life at the moment. Um, is like, yeah, things are going to go wrong. It's high stakes stuff, right? We're trying to build million dollar companies, global podcasts. Things are going to go wrong. But the main thing is how will I react to the problems when they come? Amen to that. 
it's it's not what you do and the when the problem happens it's what you do afterwards it's very very nice uh, i i remember mm. we before the the war in ukraine i had two offices in kiev no and way. yeah yeah it's a very very beautiful city it's hyper fast internet great to work you know you can order that was like way before you could order stuff like groceries anywhere in the west but in kiev you could already do that it's a very efficient city but at some point in the winter, they had some issues with the gas or something like that. So they sometimes turned the power down. And we were doing a uh, an online boot camp for our clients. It was like 1,000 or 1,500 per, per head per client. So, and there was like 30 or 40 clients that were all linked in online. And it was supposed to be like a 10 hour online event. And we're literally starting it and 30 minutes in the power goes out. And of course, everything shuts down, Wi-Fi shuts down, computers shut down. And we literally just called because I had an assistant. She was Ukrainian. She spoke the language. We just had her call and get an actual generator, like a gasoline power generator. I'm like, get the generator here. Tell them to hurry up and just start and like, and all of a sudden we had freaking power again to run the damn online thing, (laughs) whatever it takes, you know? Hey, real quick, I'm not having any sponsors or promotions in my podcast because I'm only asking for one thing, and that is that you give us a five-star rating. Whether you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, there's probably some sort of rating function. If you're watching this on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment. It's the only thing I'm asking you for because that allows us to rank higher, and that allows me to give more awesome value to more people, reach more people, and also get more awesome guests on board. So if you haven't done so yet, please leave us a five-star rating. Without any further ado, Let's crack into it. To to shift the, the the topic here a little bit, your your backgrounds in in bodybuilding. Now, whenever someone goes to the fitness niche or personal development, I always ask them what was the one thing that made them commit to it. What got you into bodybuilding? Such a good question. So, I was playing sport at a very high level all my life. Uh, I wanted to go on and play a professional sport. I played a rugby. Uh, I was a sprinter, nice. a hundred meter sprinter, but you don't see many Irish people in the Olympics, right? So at 17, I had to move away from athletics and focus on rugby because there was a path to get a professional contract. There is a path laid out to you. You have to go and actually do it, of course, but I was on that path. And a week later, I dislocated my kneecap, tore my cruciate, oh. popped my kneecap, finished forever. And this practice is practice or, or what happened? At practice. So I jumped for a ball, right? A ball was kicked to me. I jumped for a ball. I leaned over my back like this. And my toe was up here. No one came near me, bro. No one came near me. My knee just popped out, gone forever. It was fucked, right? Wait for this. It's the best part. I got rushed to the hospital. I'm in the hospital. They crack my knee back in together. My knees pop back in. And I'm lying there on, on, the, on the operation table, basically half a human. And the doctor comes in and he's like, oh, how's the car? I'm like, what do you mean a car? And he's like, you were in a car crash, right? And I was like, no. He was like, I've never seen someone's knee so fucked up that I actually (laughs) thought that they were in a car crash. And I was like, no one even touched me. This is the irony. No one even touched me, dude. And I got up and he was like, look, you can't ever play contact sport ever again. You're going to be lucky to ever run again or even walk again because my foot had completely detangled. And at that point, I said, fuck you, I'm going to get back in six months' time. So I had gone straight into my rehab the next day, which was in a gym, and I had got back to playing high-level rugby in around four months. Bear in mind, Damn. this will get kneecap. I could get back in. I went back to do a small bit of training at that point, and at that point, I had to make a decision being like, I just can't go through this system, right? This this process, if mm. my if it goes again. And that's when I guess like walked away from it. But I wanted to get back in four months and I got back in four months. Now, during that process is when I was in a rehab center for my knee. I was basically relearning how to walk with people that were in care crashes, like very, very horrific injuries. And after when I graduated from the rehab center, I went back to a gym. And for me, it was like, where can I go that's, locked away isolated as fuck and i went to like a pro bodybuilding gym and i was around 17 years old mm-hmm. everyone in there was in their late 20s they were competitors and that's when i just fell into the fell into the process right so the guys that were in there i was in there at six o'clock in the morning every single day i was bear in mind i had a mechanical leg during this process and all i could do was like bench i could do some small leg exercises on the other leg and some like recovery stuff for my own knee and 
I just fell in love with that process of like, it's just a compounded effect. And everything in my life since that moment has all came back to the same principles of bodybuilding. It's going to take longer than you think it's going to be. It's going to be harder than you think it is. Mm. It's going to, you're going to be on your own. No one's going to give a fuck. No one can do the work for you. There's no one that can basically help you in this process, but you, right? It's all about the metrics. It's all about the data. It's all about the analytics. It's all about the fine, small details is what will make you, is what will make you achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. So I got back super quick in the sport and then I went back into, I mainly focused on bodybuilding then. So from 18 to 21, I was deep down that, you know, the early kind of bodybuilding space, went into competitive bodybuilding, was competing nationally for a while in no men's shit. physique. And then I, you know, I've always really enjoyed it. Um, I've always had a very high bar for myself because that, those frameworks that I discussed are everything basically in the thesis of how I studied, how I worked, how I built my businesses, how I built my podcast. It's all about as cliche as it sounds as a, the delayed gratification. Now, later on, you know, at 20, at 27 or 26, should I say, I went back to training at a very, very high level. And I mean, like, you know, high performance coach, daily check-ins, every single inch calculated. Now I was still doing it myself, but it was less intentional. But when I started getting my own coach back at 20 in when I was 26, that's when I went like really deep down the, the avenue. And I was going to go for a, a pro show last year, but I came to this decision with my coach, which was right, you got two call, you got two options. You can build a potentially a figure business and really put everything in your life into doing that. Or you can have shredded glutes on stage and put on fake tan. And it was like, you can only do one. You can do anything in life, but you can't do everything. So I said, fuck the fake tan. Let's just go all into the business. And we made that transition about a year ago, which was just like, everything is going to be driven towards the business now. Like everything we do, because we're not making decision of doing other stuff is going to be geared down towards there. And, you know, I do have aspirations to move more into endurance and move more into ultras and so on. But again, it goes back to that question. Do I want to build a global business, a really big business? Um, or do I want to run around a fucking jungle for two days straight, which is an ultra marathon, right? And I think there's different stages in your life, but you can't have both, right? And you can still do other things. So I'm super, super dialed in still. I've actually changed my diet completely, which we can talk about actually would be good. So after 14 years of bodybuilding, since I was 14, um, I've completely went away from the bodybuilding uh, diet now. I've completely moved off of that, which we can talk about if you want, if you want to. But yeah, man, that's how I think about it. And I think that everything we do comes back to resistance, the challenge and the obstacle. And the obstacle obstacle can be reading, it can be fitness, it can be it can be anything, but you need to have that obstacle, which for me has always been bodybuilding. Damn, I, I really resonated with that part of the doctors telling you you can't do that. Um, mm. My my background before I got into business was, and it was actually the catalyst why I got into business, was also an injury. I, I wanted to become a professional musician. I play guitar. And uh, I was preparing to get into the Conservatory of Vienna, which is one of the most prestigious conservatories. So I was playing guitar like 12 hours a day, just wake up, play, eat, play, go to sleep. And, and then I woke up one day with really, really harsh pain in my left arm and I had tendonitis, you know, tennis elbow, how they mm -hmm. call it. It's very common for guitar players. So I go to the doctor and they're like, oh yeah, you can't like, stop. You're not going to be able to play ever anymore. Just, you know, find something else. And I mm -hmm. said the same, I'm like, Fuck you, thank you, bye. Went to the next one the same day and they told me the same. So I went to five doctors and all five of them said, forget about it, this is it. It's, it's gonna become a chronic pain thing and you're done. Um, and that really, re I was 19. That was like the only thing I wanted to do as a freaking 19 year old. And then out of that, I got really depressed and that's where I started my personal development journey. And for me, it kind of manifested in the dating part because I was a 19 year old, stupid kid thinking that, oh, the reason why I'm unhappy is because I don't have a girlfriend, you know, like it was not mm. like I'm unhappy because I was deprived of my sole purpose in life. And I don't know how to, how to <laughs> fix that. It was like, no, no, a girlfriend will fix it. So that's how I kind of started my journey. And then I started posting about it on, on forums. And then people asked me if I coach and that's how I slipped into my first coaching role. Um, so it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that for you, it was, it was kind of like a similar, uh, a similar journey with that rugby injury. Now, one thing that was that I found interesting, what you said is like marathon running, ultra running, and so on and so forth. And I hear that so many times from high level entrepreneurs, they kind of have that, they get sucked into adventures into the extreme. Why do you think is that? 
Do you have any sort of clue why so many entrepreneurs get hooked by like crazy adventures and like extreme situations? Life has become too easy for people right now. It's you're not going to die. If you start a business, it's not going to go. You're not going to end up in fucking on the street, right? For the most part, things are given to us and it's super easy, right? There's no real repercussions of like life or death from our from our actions. We can get food easy. We can get social welfare, all this bullshit. So men are seeking difficult resistance change because it makes us feel something. When we're running a business and we get a bit of success, we've had thousands and thousands of miniature losses that have happened. And that's we that's, that's basically been compounded. So when we get one bit of success, we, we love it, right? We chase that success. And that's part of like the entrepreneur's journey, but it's also the journey of life. So feeding into like, uh, fitness and so on. When I wanted to go compete again, it wasn't because I wanted to stand on stage and get fucking naked on stage. It was because I wanted that that urgency, the the time that's required, that the difficulty, the challenge, the sacrifice basically that's required to do something very difficult. And for a lot of guys, they don't have the skill to be able to get on stage. They don't have the genetics, let's say, to get on stage. But everyone can do ultras and everyone can do marathons because it's actually not a competition against other people. It's a competition with yourself and it's a competition with your mind. So that's when ultras becomes very attractive. So during the pandemic, I was living in Dublin at the time and they had a load of bullshit uh, rules that I followed, none of them, to be honest. And one of them was that you had to like stay within like a radius, right? So mm. as a result, I got up every single week and every all the gyms were closed. I started running marathons every <laughs> week. So every Saturday, I would wake up and I would run a fucking marathon, man, in like Jesus a 10 Christ. mile uh, radius. I would run a half marathon on Tuesday, half marathon on Thursday, and I'd run a marathon on Saturday. And I did it because I was working in tech. It was boring as fuck. I hated people I was working with for the most part. They just weren't on the same vibe as me. They didn't have that same like killer instinct the desire to go for big things so i had to get my outlet through endurance through running and for some people they'll get the outlet through partying drink drugs sex and whatnot which to be honest pre-covid that's what a lot of people did because they could go to the club and you know give out about their boss uh from monday to friday and then go and kind of give it and just release on friday and saturday which mm. you know for many rate many years i did something similar but when you remove that, you can basically get the opposite. You can chase something that's difficult. And there's a lot of, there's a huge benefits for that as well in terms of like being able to take those lessons and bring them into other areas of life. So generally, if you're someone who can show up in your business and so on and really handle that, you can be a lot more stressed with other things that go on in life. You know, like planning, future planning. It could be to do with a house. It could be to do with life. Because you've kind of been through it, right? You've been through it. Whereas often I find that people who haven't gone through the hard stuff, whether it's fitness, business, or the mind, they'll throw their hands up at the most basic shit, the most stupid shit that happens. You know, something goes wrong and they'll blame, they'll, they'll really blow off the edge. But you're just trying to build up mental resilience and you can get it from multiple different avenues. But I think the endurance element is really interesting because it's the least sexy way to explore aspects of your mind. What I found interesting is because, uh, yeah, we have it much easier now than ever before. Like we don't have to hunt mammoths to eat. We just go to the store, we buy a bunch of steaks. But then at the same time, like as a business owner, you probably still have it the most difficult out of any sort of a layer in, in, in a Western civilized society, because there is the pressure to perform mm. you're not getting sh you're not getting paid to show up like you do at a job you get paid to fucking deliver so there's a lot of anxiety there's a lot of pressure there's a lot of worry that that f feeds into it so one one would almost argue like as a business owner once things are running like you want to fucking be at peace for once and stay mm -hmm. away yet so many of us i i know so many entrepreneur friends that are like okay cool now let's go on an antarctica expedition now let's hike mm -hmm. up fucking kilimanjaro it's almost like we become so masochistic that we kind of need, like we want to suffer even more, you know, like we love the suffering so much. We want to do it even more. It's the adjustment, right? Because I guarantee you when you started your entrepreneurship journey, you were just like, oh, if you could, if I could just make like $2,000 a month, yeah. I wouldn't have to work a nine to five, right? 100%. But then you, but then you make the first 2000, you're like, maybe I could double it. 
Yeah. Maybe I could get to 10k a month. Maybe I could get to 20k a month. If I can get to 100k a month, if I could get to a mil a month, like what would that look like, right? Because mm. there's the hedonic adaption is that you're after getting to that new level and that new mm. essence and saying, where can we take it from there? Now, I don't even think that's a bad thing. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with thinking that that's a that's a, that's not a bad thing because it's the acceptance of you can do more and you can push more and where you are right now is great. Now, the other aspect of that is you need to be able to have the gratitude. You need to be able to be grateful of where you are to look at where we currently are. Like, you know, I'm living in Asia for many years. I have a great partner. I have a great business, a good team, good clients, like great podcast. We've hit some crazy numbers. That's great. hundred percent, but it's not the finish line. That's not the finish line. We want to keep going. We want to keep progressing, but also looking back on where we are. And my parents are good for that. You know, my dad's also good for that. He's, he's always like, you know, look at where you were, like even like two years ago or one year ago. Mm. And I still remember, but like, but at some point you need to have those overarching goals, right? Because like, I remember when we were growing initially, I was like, you know, very early on, I was probably making like $16,000 a month or something. And he was like, oh, are you going to stop when you get to like 20K a month? And I was like, no, like that's when a that's when it begins. Like that's when we get to the next stage, right? And you you can do the opposite. You can stay small. There's nothing wrong with that. You can put more time into it. But my lifestyle design is very much tailored towards like growth, business growth, opportunity growth, pushing hard. Because I have a lot of stuff automated. I have a good team. I have a lot of housekeepers. I have uh, like a chef. I have a lot of stuff. So nice. I'm not I'm not there like cleaning up fucking you know my plates and shit right we're just uh, cooking my food it's just taken care of so i can focus on the biggest driver for me where i can get asymmetrical returns which is focusing on the business focusing on content focusing on marketing on sales and that's where my asymmetrical returns comes from and yeah man i think that's just the, the beauty of it right is the fact that scale without meaning is pointless but scale when you are grateful for where you are and where you want to go to is actually a beautiful thing and a business is also a reflection of you and when you can look at a business inward and think of where i currently am and where we currently are where we want to get to it can be more of this meditative a process of businesses Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. more like this long-term infinite game that we continuously play versus the short-term hacks and tricks like you're going to see me in this arena man for a long time whether it's recording podcasts, well, it's going to be recording podcasts, doing different types of businesses or doing what we're currently doing because I'm much more in love with the game versus the outcome. Mm. The outcome mm. is a byproduct of loving the game, right? Mm. And how many people have you seen get rinsed in the past couple of years? And we're, we're due an online business recession, man. It's coming. The recession's coming and all of these people are going to get rinsed, rinsed for that exact yeah, reason. Yeah. They, they were not in it for the right reason. It's like getting into crypto, right? Getting into it for the wrong reason, right? And yeah. you just get people wrecked continuously, man. I'm looking forward to that. The the great, you know, the, the Black Friday of online marketing. And it has happened to a degree <laughs> already a little bit. But, you know, I've, I've had it myself. I've had the Black Swan event already. We we went from um, from half a million a month down to 150k a month, and it took us a lot. And I ate a lot of shit as that happened because we made a ha- half a million a month completely organically at first, and it was like on easy mode. We were like, "Holy shit, it's so easy!" And then the organic. Because when you drop, when you have an existing audience and then you drop a new program, you get a lot of closes right away. Like a lot of people that buy and then it kind of evens out. And when it was even at, evening out, we had no idea. And then we switched to cold traffic and we just ate shit for two years until we came back up to where we were before. And I had all sort of excuses to just say, well, fuck it. Now it gets difficult. Let me try to find something else that is as easy. Let me switch to something. Let me come up with another sexy offer. Instead of going the hard way and saying, no, 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 let me learn. Let me figure out how to run cold traffic, how to sell the cold traffic, how to convert cold traffic, how to have a sales team that can convert cold traffic, how to hire sales reps, keep sales reps, managing them, all that shit. Like I had an active choice. So, and now I'm kind of happy because like you said, like you kind of wish that it happens. And I kind of have the same feeling because I'm like, I am like 95% certain that if the market implodes, we'll be amongst the few survivors because I have been through shit already. And it's not its not to do with the offer. That's the funny thing is that it's fuck all to do with the offer and what you're doing. Yeah. It's to do with the individual. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we, we run a service business and it's a client-facing business. And I guarantee you if something imploded tomorrow, I would have, you know, I'd be the one that'd be setting up 
hour long calls. I'd be doing 16, 17 hour calls in one day to walk through everything with our existing clients to make sure they feel okay, to make feel happy, whatever, doing what needs to be done. Like like what mm-hmm. needs to be done. And as Matt Gray says, like the role of entrepreneurs is to look at the bottom like in the business and just go at it. Just go at it. Right? Just go at it straight straight at. And I think that's the difference, right? It's like when shit hits a fan, who's gonna be there? Like and it's it's <laughs> it's funny, right? Because like a lot of a lot of guys will throw their hands up. I think COVID was a really good example of that. Like when COVID hit, like people moved home, man. People moved in with their parents. <laughs> you know, like like how much how how much can be running away from your problems, right? <laughs> when COVID hits, you go, your mom's like, come on, there's a flu, come on. And you give up everything to move home to, into the flu, right? I just think that's a fault. I always think about that, right? It's like when mm. things hit the ro- ground running hard, things blow up. Who's going to be there to do the hard work, right? Um, mm. you need to you need a level head, man. You need to be yeah. able to channel that anxiety and like I'm not I'm not fucking master with this stuff, right? But being able to look at what's happening in your, in your business when you're anxious, channel that anxiety into action and offload the anxiety then into outcomes. And yeah. um, most people, most people can't do it, right? Um, for many years I couldn't do it, but it was being able to have the logical brain versus emotional brain in your business right keep the emotion for your relationships and keep the emotion for at home mm, this, is, this is, isn't for it's not for uh emotions for logic beautifully said man beautifully said now you've mentioned covid a couple times what did you do during covid where were you that's when i built my podcast man right <laughs> i was stuck at home i was in ireland stuck at home no idea what i was going to do I read a man search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. Oh, Things started wow. to click as as a result. And I was on this path for like purpose and fulfillment. And I wouldn't even call it like self-development. It was just figuring out what I wanted to do. And that's when I started building out kickoff sessions. From there, then we spun up, you know, a few different uh, coaching offers in the beginning. But I, the only and the reason why career, it was funny, career coaching worked really, really well. And I really enjoyed it. But I knew that I wanted to go become an entrepreneur. And I didn't want to be this entrepreneur teaching people to progress in their career, right? It was like, good for when I was there. But then when I left that world in finance tech, I knew that that had to end, like that me had to die before something else had to grow. And we were just quite split at the time, man. It was interesting. I was growing the podcast, meeting lots of entrepreneurs like yourself. Lots of people that I interviewed would be like, hey, will you come do this for me, right? Mm-hmm. So during the pandemic, I had that kind of coaching offer, which, you know, I enjoyed, but again, I didn't think it was going to be there for long. But what was happening and how Voex, my company, was built was organic, right? I mean, this is how the best businesses are built. Was I was recording with people, and like it is today, just very systematized, very output-driven, outcome-driven. And when I would finish, entrepreneurs would be like, hey, like, can you come do this for us? Or we have a podcast, can you help us do it? Hmm. So I started coaching podcasters at the time that are entrepreneurs. Hmm. And I want to get your thoughts on this too, right? Because... I was helping people and I was coaching them and it could be to do with my coaching, but I felt like that they weren't always implementing the tasks yeah. or what, what I was educating them on was quite complex. It was different aspects of editing, design, SEO, and so on. So after doing that and running that up for about, I would say nearly a year, man, from 2021, to 2022, that's when I was like, okay, we'll just do the fucking work for you. If we want to do the editing, if you want to do the production, we'll do it for you. So early 2022, that's when we started I guess you'd call it more like an agency model. We would take the podcast, run it and master it. And um, from there, then that's when we started getting like really good feedback. That's when we started really increasing our prices because, you know, out of the box, man, we were charging probably down 2K a month and we were getting people for three or six months because the thing with podcasting is the fact that people, like if, for instance, if you handed me your podcast, I couldn't do much with it in a month. I could do a lot, right? But I couldn't do enough to see measurable impacts. So the business works really well because people want to work with us for a long period of time. So people were like, all right, let's work for three months, six months. So I knew I was getting in this cash flow and the business was growing. So I was like, right, we're onto a winner here. I need to learn how to build a team. I need to learn how to market. I need to learn how to sell, how to improve the offer. And the offer just kept kind of improving and adjusting and iterating. And now, to, and then to the point where I was like, right, I'm basically making more money from this than my nine to five. I'm working 10 hours a week with a tiny team of two, three at the time. Let's just put 80 hours into it a week, 100 hours into it a week. Let's put all my focus into it. Let's build a bigger team or a better team and bring in more people. And, you know, 
if I can say one thing to people is just to back yourself in those scenarios because whenever you're kind of like dandling between one or two mm-hmm. ideas, and this is where I was during COVID, you you often intuitively know the right direction to make, right? And you have to yeah. go go towards the bottom that can build it. And yeah, the rest is kind of history, man. <laughs> Damn, man. I remember as, as bad as COVID was for many people, like my favorite part was Conor McGregor <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> because I remember yeah. watching his, his reels, he's like, eh, Ireland is holding up great. We As long as we keep it under 200 infections a day, and I'm like, what are you, what are you, who are you? <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> I um, love watching. He was just walking around. And of course it wasn't, you, nobody kept it under 200 infections a day. Everybody got it. <laughs> but, he, but I love this attitude. It's like positive attitude. Like Ireland is, we got it, man. And, uh, and then how did you, so, and then you went back. So you were in Asia before that you came back to Ireland and then you went back or how did that work? Yeah. So my kind of like trajectory was like i was in ireland it was obviously like sucked during covid and stuff but i wanted yeah. to just get out in general the kind of like process was like i spent so many years in asia when i was younger and i remember distinctly first time coming to asia and stepping out of like bangkok airport and just feeling like the heavy heavy humidity like the mm-hmm. all like the dirt the sounds the like all the noises the smells and just being instantly hooked on asia and i was like 20 mm-hmm. years old at the time and it just changed my entire perspective. So whether I was in a heavy city like Bangkok or like lost in the islands, just doing different stuff, this really like changed my perspective. Because I traveled for so many years, but when I went to Asia, I really, really opened up that door. And I spent a lot of time in Vietnam. I spent a lot of time in Indonesia. I spent a lot of time in, in Thailand. And I knew that I was most like alive during that process, right? Mm. I was working really hard on things that I really enjoyed. And I was progressing really, really hard as a result. And I would often come back much more level-headed. I'd be much more relaxed, calmer, focused, and just with a bit of more clarity. So my whole idea was let's move basically out of Europe, out of the Western world. And that's when I got into Singapore. So I was working with a tech company in Singapore and I love Singapore. It was a great city. It's a bit expensive, whatever, but like, you know, I was living downtown like a penthouse basically, right? (laughs) And so it's going to be fucking expensive. And at that point then, that's when I was like, okay, I want to build like a lifestyle around us. Uh, I knew we were growing a lot with the company as well. I knew that even what we had, we could basically scale. So I was like, how do I build an ecosystem, a lifestyle around things that we should be around, right? In nature, in the sun, whole food, whole food, no like uh, preserved food, no processed food, none of that bullshit, mm, nice. swimming in the sea, like everything organic, everything natural, man. And like, everything in my house is natural. Like as in these glasses, like these jars that I have, like everything is like normal and, and um, nice. natural the way things should be. Uh, and that's when I really want to kind of move more into like that lifestyle. So I, I think it's just like, you know, you, you kind of crawl before you can walk. And I think now the only places that I would ever live is, is, is in Asia and maybe Dubai, you know, I spent a lot of time in Dubai and Dubai is good for business, but again, it's kind of like, you, you, you can't really spend too long in Dubai at once. And that's Everybody the only that, places yeah. for me, right? It's the only places for me that I really want to be around. Uh, some aspects of America too, right? My partner's American. I do, I do like America, uh, but you need to be someone who is pushing yeah. for it, right? America mm. is, you're either at the top end or at the bottom. Mm. Man, you, you really are selling me Asia right now. Like I've got so many friends lately that moved to Thailand, Vietnam, and so in Singapore. Ah, damn. And I'm like, maybe, maybe I should check it out. I, I was in uh, Tokyo last last year for a full month because also I wanted to stay, not, not in a hotel. Like I got an Airbnb. We just worked there and, and you know, on our off time, went and explored the city. It's so great. It's so amazing. It just feels like a different fucking planet. And uh, I, I feel like in Europe, when you're, unless you're in, I can't even think of any specific European city, maybe London, unless you're in London, you kind of always feel a bit disconnected from the world. So most people are either in Dubai or in Asia or they're in the States. And then here you are in Europe and like, you don't see that many entrepreneurs. Cyprus is another place. It's kind of becoming the second Dubai. Uh, I spent two months a year there minimum. And it's, it's becoming really great. There's a lot of online op- entrepreneurs there. But like other than that, you kind of feel a little isolated in Europe. At least that's how I felt. For sure, man. Uh, and again, you don't necessarily want to be around people all the time. I do find mm-hmm. that is that you do kind of want your own peers or you, you put the work in, right? But it's good to have that like 
uh, I wouldn't really say support network or just be in that right place that's in alignment, right? I wouldn't really say that London sometimes is actually the opposite. Like, because London, it, it does a lot of emphasis on like working for these big companies. Like, it's like the natural progression. When I came out of school, no one asked like what business you want to build. They want to ask yeah. what company you want to work for, right? And I just didn't like that mantra, that mentality. Mm. And it was funny, right? Like, I when I started my podcast, I was invited everywhere to speak, right? I would be at like, man, I would be at like 10 universities a year speaking. It was remote at the time, but like so many, right? And now when I built my business, no one wants to talk to me. (laughs) This is the irony, right? (laughs) It's like, like they push you towards that agenda, man, like 100%. And when I was playing that game and I had like a careers podcast, everyone wanted to interview. But when you had, when you're building a business, they're like, no, we don't want to be involved with that stuff anymore. It's funny. I feel like it's changed a lot over the last two decades that building a business is becoming sexier and more like accepted in the mainstream, but it's still miles away from anything. People are still like, oh, but it's not risky. Oh, but are you sure? It's like basically akin to gambling. It's like almost you would tell like, hey, I want to become a professional gambler. Like you almost get the same resistance from your friends and family. Like what the, like, isn't that like super dangerous? When in reality, and and funny enough, also to get back to COVID, like COVID has brought the risk factor of 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 an of of a regular job to the level of business, because all of a mm-hmm. sudden companies were like, "Fuck it, you're fired." Like we can't, you know, yeah. we're, we're not open. So this whole idea that that was still prevalent 50 years ago, like get a stable job and stay with that company for 50 years, it's still prevalent even though it's not based in any reality anymore. And one hundred percent. Yeah, and 100%. but if you have your own business, at the very least, you're in control. Meaning, your business is not doing well. We'll figure out what's what's going on and make sure you get more clients. Right? It's like at least you're steering the wheel. Man, being an employee doesn't teach you any skills. You mm. don't have like one fundamental skill that you could trade for money or you could leverage and you can grow if you just are working on a company. You could be someone who does lots of things, right? So then yeah. when you get fired, you have no way to instantly leverage that skill for money, right? You're just yeah. dependent on someone else picking you up and then basically you doing the scraps for them to get paid, underpaid. Bear in mind, the role of an entrepreneur is not to maximize employees' salaries, it's to maximize profit. So as a result, hmm. you are not going to be making that much money, right? And the irony of this is the fact that therefore having a job is actually more dangerous than having your own business because let's say for all for all intents and, intents and pers- purposes, the coaching model that brings in a law and you can't coach people without a certificate anymore. Well, then you can take those skills and you could implement it for someone in an agency. You could also build a coaching software for this new license that comes up. You could also build another SaaS platform. You could build out a, a copywriting platform for this because you've learned all of those skills and gone very deep on a, on a handful of them it makes you someone very, very strong to fuck with, right? People will have $500 in the bank account and tell you that it's risky to start a business, whereas it should be the opposite way around, right? Hmm. If something happened to us, we could do something else, right? We have mm-hmm. we have leverage, right? We have an email list, we have uh, social accounts, we have experience, we have business, we have a network, and we also have a reputation, right? Um, yep. Now, I do always, like I always want to grow our company for sure, 100%, uh, but I think there's also an opportunity to build like software around the company. For sure, right, and not right now, but obviously just within 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 uh, scope of the future. Now, let me give you a hypothetical scenario. Who do you think is going to succeed more? Right, there's me with four years of experience in podcasting, has released five hundred episodes a year, has managed thirty five podcasts, and has done fifty million views, and has a massive email list and like eighty thousand followers to do with podcasting, or someone who is in a job just got just gets fired. And now is scrambling to figure out how to build a product, a software product, because they used to work for a tech company and that mm. tech company has software, right? Man, it's just, it's just apples and oranges, right? Yep. Now, fast forward 10 years of where we're going to be. So me, 10 years from now, whatever. The employee, 10 years from now, 10 years of inertia, 10 years of no change, 10 years of complacency they're probably overweight they're probably lazy they probably have a bunch of kids they're probably married they could be remarried (laughs) think of that scenario right and i'm not like competing against that what i'm competing against is obviously someone who's at the same level as me who's progressing trying to steal my business right and there's a ton of them out there i'll tell you that much Mm. but at the same point like this is this is where we get to the disparity so let me just give an example so 
when when I left college, <clears throat> so 2022, 2023, or sorry, 20, 2019. So when I left college in 2019, we were all pretty much the same. We all looked the same. We had the same jobs. We had the same grades, same interests, same girlfriends at times. We had the same <laughs> background, right? So everyone started off pretty same. Two to three years later, the diverge has happened. Some people have gone into big companies, small companies, not started companies, started businesses. Some people have gone travel the world. But now three or four years later, we've seen the divergence. We've seen where people ended up. Some guys making 30K a year. Some guys making 3 mil a year. Some guys in their mama's basement, right? Mm. Now, time reveals everything. And the longer you stay away from uh, making those actions, evaluating time, evaluating the impact of time, the bigger the disparity and variance grows. And it's only until a matter of time, until you can't make the changes, that you are screwed and you are leveled down. You're heavily mortgaged, family, kids, all this stuff, your golden handcuffs and some job paying you 60K a year. And I just think it's an interesting observation because that world is shot on this world for many years until they can't and they have no more excuses. And this is an interesting observation, man. You should never, I think it's interesting, like you should never be at a point whereby as an adult and as a man, your wealth and your success and your relationships depend on someone else. Yeah. Like that is bullshit to me. As a kid, it made sense to me. I had a pair of parents. They used to take care of me. They used to drive me to football, to rugby, whatever. As a, in university, I had lecturers who would teach me and I would go into exams and learn their information. Yep. As an early employee at 22 years old, I had people that were 50 that were VPs and MDs and they were teaching me. But at 25, 26, I knew more than these fucking dudes, <laughs> right? And then at 27, I was making more than the, more more a month than some of these dudes would do in a year, mm. man. That's the irony, right? That's mm. actually the irony of this stuff of leverage. And yeah, most people don't want to hear it. It's an uncomfortable truth, so that people don't want to hear. I mean, there's there's a couple of points that you mentioned that are really good. So it's like, first of all, as an employee, you think you can do something a lot of times, like, oh, I can build a software because I worked in a software company. But what <laughs> usually happens in, in, in the context of a company is like, Companies make it look very easy if you're just a small part of the greater whole. You're like, oh, well, this is the exact same thing that I'm that I'm doing that I would do I could do in my own business, right? But then the thing is like, maybe the company gave you the clients to work with, so you were just on the delivery side of things. So now all of a sudden you're like, wait, but where are the clients? Oh shit, no, it's on me to get the clients now. <laughs> yeah, I've I've team. seen this so many times. Not, not to not to shit on anybody, but I've seen it with with people that, for example, were. Um, that worked in one of my companies many years ago and then they left because they wanted to do it themselves yeah because i made it fucking look easy motherfucker you know like yeah, i would man. i had built a brand for 10 years so you could then just have someone on the phone and close them and now they're like oh i just built my own business and then they're like where are the leads my calendar doesn't have leads today oh shit i gotta do it myself man, <laughs> so, so funny so when i worked in a i worked in a series series d startup right and um it was growing really, really fast, like one of the biggest fintech companies in the world. And I was a product owner. So I was 24 as a product owner and I ran software teams. I had 20 engineers and I was building very advanced technical trading software, uh, very difficult trading software. But my whole role was this small feature within the company, which is kind of like a mini company within the company. But man, I didn't have to worry about tax. Didn't have to yeah. worry about legal. Didn't have to worry about market, GTM. Didn't have to worry about any of this stuff. All I had to worry about was putting the button on the fucking app, right? And <laughs> the amount of guys that leave to go build software companies, they raised a ton of money because they were like, I was a product owner of this company. Mm -hmm. And then they basically raised a ton of money. They blow it all on like a VC raising parties and they end up with nothing at the end of it. Whereas like, I kind of knew that from building at Voix in the early days. I was like, well, okay, we can add a podcast, but we need leads. And then we need to sign contracts, which uses DocuSign. And then we need mm. this and then this and then this. So I kind of envisioned that and I and I kind of had this skeleton. So then when I went off and did it myself, I was like, all we got to do here is add on more of what we have, more of the basics, refine the basics, refine the processes, uh, make the process better. And that's what, that's what a service business is, right? Is what is the process? How do we make it better? That's basically all we, all we do. Higher performance, higher quality. Um, and yeah, man, I don't know, like, again, it goes back to that kind of meditative, meditative approach towards business that like, it's just a journey. Like it's a journey of self-discovery disguised in the path of profitability. Amen. Amen to that. 
And then the other thing is also that you said it's like uh, time compounds. Oh, and that's yeah. really, really key. Like you said, it's like the starting point is whatever. You get out of high school, you get out of college. Everybody's roughly at the same stage. Although there's already people who side hustle their ass, build a business next to fucking full-time college. And those, and those, in those cases, you already got a head start. But like you said, like five years later, even though everybody had the same starting point, it varies, it ranges between you back in your mom's basement to you got a decent six figure job to, Hey, you built a seven figure business. And then, but then you extrapolate that with another 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, like how the fuck is that going to compound? Like I, I, I just talked about this yesterday to some of my advanced clients, you know, those are guys who make 50 to hundred K a month. And they're like, what do I do with the money? Like, I don't have incentive to make even more. It's just, you know, they can't even fathom making more than hundred K a month. So I'm like, look, just, just imagine, you make you make 100k a month you got 50 percent profit margins which means you make 50k after taxes and all that you take home yourself after each month let's say you live off 10k a month and i myself right now i spend around 10k a month on personal things like whatever guitars food taking my girlfriend out and that's i live like a king on 10k a month it's not even a lot of money I can, uh, there, there's no concessions that I need to make. You know, I go to a nice gym. Mm -hmm. I go to nice restaurants. I eat steak every day. Like I'm a very simple dude. I play video games. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. And I'm like that 10K a month, it finances a really king lifestyle for me. You know, can I fly first class and stuff like that with 10K a month every, every month? Probably not, but I don't need to. For my lifestyle, it's pretty much enough. So let's say I, I make 50K profit and you live nicely on 10K a month. That means... You got 40K left over. And out of these 40K, you take 20K and you just invest them in something. And the other 20K, you just save up. You put them on a bank account just in case, you know, for rainy days. So now you're investing mm -hmm. 20K each and every month off your profits. You throw it in stocks. You buy some gold, silver, whatever. Hell, you, if you feel like gambling, throw it in crypto as well if you want. Now, just imagine like you do that for a year. So now you're spending, now you're putting 240,000 euros or dollars a year on investments that all grow even if you get a 5% return of investment of these 240K, that's an extra thousand euros that you just get from doing nothing just a month, just, just from just from growing your wealth. And that's just from a single year. Now that compounds over 10 years, imagine that. So time compounds like crazy in the positive, but like you said, it also compounds in the fucking negative. Every oh, single <laughs> day that you're spending at home not doing that, that compounds, that one day, that one week where you're just slacking off where you, you know, I know you, you have a huge background in where you said you were partying, you were drinking, and then you stopped doing that. So every single weekend where you're spending two nights just drinking out partying and then two, not two fucking days to recover, that's four fucking days. There might not be a lot, but in the compounding effect, that is huge. Bro, it is absolutely everything, right? And so the asymmetrical returns works positively and negatively in that regard. Mm. And if you're not, if you're moving in the wrong direction, it's only going to get worse, man. And you said four days, four days is more than half of the week. Right. Mm. And the biggest thing with uh, time is the fact that everything has, everyone knows that time has a cause and effect, but they don't understand the variable of time. They don't understand how long it will take for that to take an effect. So if you eat McDonald's and if you eat McDonald's every day, like, yeah, you'll feel like shit. So you won't mm. do it. But if you go out and party and just have a few beers and da da da, yeah, you'll you'll feel bad one day, but the following week you're gonna forget about it and move on. Now that will have an impact on your liver, on your gut, mm -hmm. on everything. Ten years, twenty years, thirty years from now, until you end up getting like a terminal illness, right? So these are these are how things can compound negatively and positively, and that's the difference for it, right? One thing I would say about you know making like that fifty k and reinvesting it is, imagine if you didn't reinvest in an index fund and you invested in yourself. You put that investment back in yourself, which is what we've done, right? I've still had like our true and true like investments, whatever, but I've mainly been reinvesting back in my own education and reinvesting back in the gaps I had, investing in my team, right? Like how can we decrease our profit margin right now to increase our revenue, to increase our profit margins in the future? Better team, better education, investing in them. How do we forego, how do we say no to the cookie today to get yeah, yeah. a fucking play the cookies in a month, right? And mm. I really saw that. It was really instilled with me by people like Dakota Robertson, JK Molina, a few of you guys really kind of Dan Go, really baked in that forever learning mentality. Yep. And how like that has the biggest return. So let me give you a practical example for people. So uh I've I've always done founder-led sales. Um 
I'm good. I, I know my product. I know problems. I know podcasts. I know the space. And people often want to speak to me. So when they come in, people want to set up calls and I want to work with them, whatever. I did that for so long. And then I was like, look, I want to replace me in a sales function. I want to bring in setters, sales teams, sales reps, so on. I have two choices. I can pay with my time, spend the next year learning how to manage a sales team, learning how to create KPIs, learning frameworks, learning tools, learning how to write documentation, learning how to improve this documentation. And at the very end of it, I still might not be successful and I still might not have the goal of what I'm trying to achieve. Or I can pay with my wallet. I can go to someone who's done it before, who's helped thousands of people and who can basically solve my problems for me today. And straight away at that point, I started working with automated revenue. I wired them seven and a half thousand dollars. And the next day I was in a coaching program. I finished the entire coaching program in three days. I was nice. the only person who watched the last Loom video. I could I could see who saw it. I was the only person. It said zero views. I was the only person. Not, not to discredit the program, but that could show us who fucking actually learns. Yeah. That was on a, so I sent him the money on a Friday. I finished the program on a Sunday. And on the Monday, I messaged him being like, right, I'm ready to take in the setters. Had the setter in, had the interview on Tuesday, gave him the offer on Thursday. He was in the company on Friday. Boom. It was exactly seven days between I'd wired the money, I'd learned the information, I'd hate the documentation, I brought in the setter. I indoctrinated him and now he's a fucking killer. Mm. That took seven days, seven and a half K versus God knows how much, the intangible amount that you can't measure plus T plus a year of my life, right? Yeah. And I don't know about you, man, but I don't want to hit my targets in five years. I want to hit my targets. I want to take my 10 year goal and hit it in one year, right? Mm. And that's how I kind of view like life and business. And because I've thankfully, well, not thankfully, but for the most part, I identified what I kind of want to get. And then as a result, I can either do two things. I can pay with my time, more exploration, or play with my wallet and get there faster. Mm. Money loves speed, how they say, you know. Mm -hmm. and now, you've mentioned you've mentioned your girlfriend quite a couple of times. And I saw in one of your, in your podcasts, you described her as like pretty much the opposite of you. Very easygoing, very relaxed. And I'm like, it's exactly the same dynamic I have with my girlfriend. I am the... I am constantly under tension. I'm a worrier. Mm. Like I worry a lot. I'm always like, what happens with this? The contingency plan, A, B, C, D, structure, full control over everything. And she's the complete polar opposite. She's just like, yeah, whatever. Right? Like when we yeah. go somewhere, <laughs> when, when we when we do a trip, I'm like, okay, where's the hotel? How far away is the butcher? Where's the gym? What are we going to do on day one? And she's like, we're just going to go there. Like, stop. Like, Jesus, you're taking all the fun out of it. And, um, and, but then on the other hand, you see people like, like Alex Hormozzi, right? Leia Hormozzi, his wife, she's very much the same as him. And he often talks about how she pushes him. And, and da, da, da. But then I hear people like you talk about like, okay, it's more like a thing where you balance each other out. Um, how is it with you guys? Can you describe, could you go a little bit deeper into that? Is, you know, I don't want to ask for too much privacy, but you know what I mean? A great partner brings you peace. A partner is not meant to bring you drama, highs, lows, these peaks and troughs in a relationship is meant to give you that calm sense of like, you know, understanding, clarity and peace. Right. And that can come from a type A type B personality, which is what I have with my partner. Whereby she's super relaxed. She's super calm. She's like a yoga teacher. She wants like everything nice and chill. She like mm. takes care of like all of her dogs. She, that's a huge like passion of hers. And that's what she works on. And in contrast, then, when I have that speed of execution, need to get shit done, need to move faster, need to move faster, that offsets it. And people will say, well, that pulls you back from the goal. That's bullshit. If anything, it's the opposite. For me, it moves me forward to the goal because I have like a responsibility and accountability that I want to be at a certain level and maintain that level of discipline, of precision, of excellence, basically, to show up in my business and in my relationship to be someone who's like a good human, right? Mm. And I've often analyzed this of myself. When I'm with Elise at home, I work better than if I'm on my own. If I'm mm. on my own, I might check my phone, I might you know, go for a walk. I might like, uh, like sit down and have a coffee. I might read a bit more, but when she's there, I have, I almost feel like an intuition or a more of a subconscious level of responsibility that I'm like, gotta mm -hmm. get my work done. I have to do my outreach, get my outreach done. I have sales calls coming up, plan for the sales calls. I have team calls coming up. I have my one-to-ones coming up and I just, I'm much more on the ball, much more on the ball. And then I have much more free time as a result then to be able mm -hmm. to give time into my relationship because I know that, 
if I'm grinding it out, which I use my calls from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., that I'll grind it out from 6 to like 11, and then we'll chill. We have like a breakfast together, which can be, for me, like five or six eggs, loads of exotic fruit and so on. Nice. And then we'll go train together, and then we'll train together. And bear in mind, like, she's a different fucking fucking like she's different body shape than me right and we still yeah. train together and it still pushes me forward right hmm. making more progress now at 28 than i did at 21 and i think that element of the opposite can work really well and let me give you another kind of example right is this is the reason why so just saying actually on the relationship side first is that i don't think i could be in a relationship with someone who's like this boss baby who's like oh like you know want to be like a managing director of like fucking Goldman Sachs hmm. because it would just be this constant clash of like who has the biggest dick in the house right yeah, it's yeah. basically just a like constant like competition and so on and then we just grow we'd end up growing like resentful of one another and hmm. then there's just a, a clear lack of responsibilities in the home because as a result we're both grinding it out it's like one o'clock in the morning she takes sales calls I'm taking sales calls and it's this massive like clash whereas like if we wake up in the morning we have three dogs and at least might say to me like oh do you mind like taking care of like the dog's food i'm like i actually just can't i'm like exhausted i need to like sit down here and have breakfast so she's like yeah chill no worries and then in the evening then i might take the dogs for a walk where she might be kind of busy or might be tired and i'm happy to do it because i'm trying to decompress from work anyway Mm -hmm. in the evening so there needs to be that yin and yang this whole idea of like we're both on the same pad and we're both thriving it's kind of stupid now in alex and layla's uh, example I think they're quite a nuanced, right? They're quite a they're an outlier to the scenario because they both seem to have the same views on like life in terms of like uh, parenthood. I don't think they really want children. I'm not too sure. They're looking more for to leave the legacy in the business versus like individuals. And then they kind of have that big growth mentality, right? They they're looking for that, like billion dollar company versus a chill lifestyle. So. Mm. Of course, they're outliers. There's obviously going to be uh, nuances to the case. But again, it goes back to relationships, right? Um, Even with like, you know, two guys. A lot, as we've talked about today, about where you're located. Um, Even though I'm in a place where there's a lot of entrepreneurs, I actually don't want to hang out with entrepreneurs all the time. Like I went for dinner with my mate Abraham last week and it was great. We went for a huge dinner. We hadn't seen each other for months. And he's gone through loads of changes. I've gone through loads of changes. And it was really, really great. And then we finished it. And I was like, oh, that was great. Fantastic. But I wouldn't want to do that like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I think there's like a an, an area, an era of like entrepreneur porn whereby people like mm-hmm. lean into that stuff way more. Like I need to be living with all these guys and all of coaching programs. So I think a lot of that stuff is kind of bullshit because at the end of the day, it's a it's a journey with yourself. Um, and it's great to have a partner with you to be able to help you in that regard, right? Who's a, you know, um, a romantic partner. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, but I, I often think that a lot of businesses they will get into business with people to them. So they'll have a co-founder. But we need to have that kind of balance, right? We need to have a way that there needs to be the yin and yang in a business. And the perfect example of that is going to be in in, in tech. You're going to have mm. a sales and marketing CEO and a CTO then who's going to be the, the implementer, the builder. But I feel like for most businesses, you don't need a co-founder. You need a you need better friends, board mm. of advisors, people around you. Now, again, it's obviously nuanced, right? But I mean, I think you need someone that's on the opposite end of the spectrum with you. Otherwise, you could be just diluting uh, profit for no reason. Like, man, I've seen businesses with four <laughs> co-founders, and they're all the same fucking people, right? They all take like twenty five percent. They run their ads. <laughs> they run their ads. They do their GP. They don't even. They don't even know what net profit is, right? They don't. That, they don't even realize what that is. <laughs> and then, when everything is divided, they probably have like seven percent of a payout, right? And yeah. yeah, man, I just I just look at those businesses and I just think like you just don't know anything about like anything and. um yeah, these, these, they'll find out themselves, right? I mean, I mean, I think a big a big reason why people do it is because it's scary, so they want to do it with their friend as opposed to having all the responsibility on them. It's cope, own. man. It's cope, yeah, man. That, that, that's definitely that's that's deflecting blame, right? And you probably see this in your business too, right? When you bring in someone, and someone isn't successful, they will blame you, right? They'll blame you for the method. We we've had that. We've had people say to us, "Well, it's obviously the way that you market podcasts. It's obviously, the way you grow podcasts." It's like, it's like, no, dude. Like, we've done this before. We're telling you how to change it. You don't make the changes. It's on you, right? People will use people as scapegoats all the time. And in a business relationship, having a space go- uh, um, a scapegoat is is basically like the biggest red flag of all time, right? Because mm-hmm. there's so much money involved. There's your livelihood. There's your there's everything involved in it. Yeah. And I just think about this, right? I, man, like I, you probably know this too, right? But let's take a scenario. 
two co-founders, guys at a university, 25 years old. They build a company, whatever company it is, and start business. At 30, one guy is married. The wife says, business, risky yeah. business. We're going to mm. kid in two years. Does this roll over here for Goldman Sachs? You should go do it. The other guy is divorced. He has nothing else on his hand, right? This is what happens. This is what happens mm. in life, man. He needs this business to work because he has all the other stuff he needs to pay for. So he's like, we need to grow the business. The other guy is like, we need to close down the business. One guy won't pay out the other guy. Other guy won't pay out the other guy. And as a result, they both lose their friends. They were best friends all their life. How many times does that happen? How many fucking times? Yeah. It happens yeah. all the time, man. Plus, the thing is, like you said correctly, like if you want to partner up with something, somebody, then partner up with somebody that complements your skills. Like if you're the artist, partner something, partner up with someone that is the closer, the sales guy that wants to get the money. If you're the guy who wants to focus on sales, partner up with the artist that just wants to create something. Like there should be a reason behind why you want to be partnering up and not just randomly doing. Plus, it's, and this is the biggest one, partnering up with a friend there is almost no upside. It's only downside. And the downside is you're going to lose a really good friend. Like your friendship is not going to get better by building a business together. It can only suffer from that. And again, like exception, Alex and Leia Hormozzi where it somehow works. But like most of the time, if you partner up with your partner or your friend, the actual personal interpersonal relationship will suffer from that. What's much better is you partner up with someone that does their job really well, that complements you really well. And then you develop a friendship because you're going through fucking thick and thin, but you start off as like, you know, a polite acquaintance and we're building this thing together. For example, my CMO, Robin Bauman and I, he's the guy with the second name on the thing. He used to be a client. Then he was in Kiev. I interviewed him because he reached like 50K a month or so. And then we hung out in the jacuzzi and he just rambled about like what he would do marketing wise for my company. He was just, you know, just because that's what he does. Like his brain is just all marketing. And I'm like, hey, you should work for us. Like, why don't you become the guy that runs our ads? So he became the guy who runs our ads. Now he's our CMO. And he went from like, I just know you as a client, like you're a complete stranger to you're working with us to like three years in, like, dude, we've been through so much shit together. I fucking mm -hmm. love you, bro. Like, like, like we've mm -hmm. developed a friendship after that. And I think that's really the only way to make it work in at least 99% of the cases. Yeah, man. Um, one of, uh, so my yeah. operations manager, Piyush, who really would be like CEO if we, if we had a big enough team uh, to do that, he he worked for a different company. So he worked for a like a short form like agency and we were looking to like ramp up for a short form for some of our clients. So I spoke with him. We were working with that company. And because I was working with him as a point of contact, I just knew that he was like super on the mm. ball that even when his team failed to deliver requirements, he was his like service delivery, his interactions, how he spoke was really good. And then one day on a call, like him, like me as a client to him, I was like, you want to just come work for me? And he was like, sure. And then basically just came in, crushed it. He's, he's crushed it ever since. He manages a lot of customer experience. He works very closely with them. Very high bar set. He runs a team. He runs operations, and he's fucking crushing it, man. And we're very close as a result. Like we've gone through more together, you know. Clients fucking us over, lost deals, everything. Like he's seen it all to the point that like we're just like bros, basically. That work on this together. And man, like he was on vacation for something recently, and I was like, when he came back, I was just like, I'm just so relieved that you're back. I'm so happy that you're back here. <laughs> That's always the best sign. Uh, it's always the best sign when someone comes back out of vacation and you're like, I'm happy you're back, man. <laughs> now, <laughs> one thing, one thing that I wanted to ask you, it's, it's completely not topic change, but you mentioned your dogs. Um, those are all rescue dogs. You rescued three dogs mm -hmm. here in, in, in Bali or where exactly? Yeah, man, we have rescued read homes, a lot of dogs. Yeah. And uh, that's a big like passion of mine as well. Just like um, in Asia in particular, there's this, uh, an overpopulation. There's always been an overpopulation issue with dogs. Uh, there's a lack of sterilization and stuff. So dogs are in pretty bad condition for the most part. So wherever I'll be in the world, like I'll always like have some sort of medication, some sort of like deworm or some sort of way to like help a dog basically no matter where we are, uh, especially when I'm traveling in the middle of sticks of nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of my dogs are completely rescued. Like a lot of them 
my first dog that we have right now was thrown off a cliff, uh, all legs broken, thrown into a ravine. Uh, had to like uh, uh rappel down like two hundred feet to get the dog uh, back, and now he's like perfectly fine. The second dog was like dumped dumped on a beach, like uh just like dumped by our owners. You know they just moved and left the country and just fuck they're like fuck dog. So we took we took her and she struggled with like atta- like attachment and anxiety like really 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 bad. Like bear in mind, she's like um so body dogs in particular like were are like, the first dog originally if you look it up they're like fourteen thousand years old but they come from like wolves originally they have mm. that wolf frame they're very athletic especially the type of dog that we have uh for one of them so they can scale walls so she can scale like a six Sick. foot wall get her get her hands over push herself over so she used to run away from houses when people tried mm. to like rescue rescue and everything and she'd run like 20 30 miles so we came back in with her with to recover her and she's doing pretty good now and uh, then the other one then as well, we rescued a good couple of dogs that were like beaten to like death basically and mm-hmm. just had to rescue them. They had parvo disease. Um, what else? Like it was parvo, this, this distemper. I had, I've had a ton of dogs with distemper. Um, and yeah, man, like not all of them like survive, but a lot of them do survive. So we get them kind of rehomed and uh, things like that and friends and family and so on. So that's a big thing that I want to give back with about give back to because i think like your impact can be multifold right it can be mm. the business it can be the podcast but it can also be do with other stuff so i like to spend a lot of my time working on that when i'm not in everything else and it's kind of therapeutic as well to some degree right when you're doing something with almost no return or no i don't know no no particular motive basically yeah you you don't expect to get any you don't you're not doing it because you're expecting to get anything out of it for you other than the the other person or in your case the other dog gets something out of it but but when i heard sure. that i'm like damn that's really fucking interesting so you haven't mm-hmm. just done that with the three dogs that you own but with multiple other dogs how does i mean co- this is completely off topic now but like how does the process work like you just walk around and you're like let's look for dogs and then let's make sure they're well and then i guess you bring them to the vet or something usually a combination of both like as in they kind of find you right at some at some mm-hmm. point um like there's a lot of people that help dogs in, in Asia and there's a lot of like dog networks and stuff that we're kind of connected with. And this is a big, like, you know, strong kind of value for us basically. And for me, especially. And yeah, man, like as in the process then is like, there's a lot of, there's always people that are looking to adopt dogs, but instead of like buying, we want to like adopt and like don't shop. So yeah. I'm very much about that. So whether it's like Facebook groups or Instagram groups or so on, there are always people there that are looking to adopt, especially people that are, that are set up in Asia uh, full time and um yeah man there's always good engagement from it um people like the story they like the journey they and my partner tells a really good part of that they're able to walk through that process really well and that's a big part of it too right do you do you bring these dogs then to families in asia or do you bring them to europe i mean there's probably got to be like a ton of paperwork involved if you bring them overseas yeah it's just just here just here it's always okay, just okay. here so uh like you know people that, that are moved here locals and stuff like that because a lot of dogs anyway are from like local families and they, they they don't have like the means and stuff so that's when people would often help them and there's lots of great like uh aid networks as a result hmm. sick all right i've you know i've always wondered my my girlfriend is huge into i love animals too but she's also very much into like helping animals and stuff like that. she's the kind of girl that like whenever i go to like an exotic location like a beach or somewhere she just starts picking up the trash and like next huh. thing you know 30 minutes in we organize like a huge trash bag and instead of just sunbathing we just walk around and picking up the plastics um and in this regard i think it's also cool she's a good influence on me because i'm like oh let, let's chill like we're on vacation and she's like no let's do something and uh, you mentioned that earlier as well with your girlfriend i feel like from what from what you've said it, it it's almost like she has this like passive influence on you when you say like just her being there wants you to be more productive or is that For some sure. sort of like an active component to it as well from coming from her side no it's just it's much more uh subconscious right it's like mm-hmm. you know she's chill man like i met her when i had like five minus five thousand dollars in my bank account and now mm-hmm. many years later nothing has changed right we're still the same people we still do the same stuff we still just like dogs and watch stupid videos on Instagram every once in a while and we're chilling out and just like laugh at dog memes and stuff because like nothing really like fundamentally changes like I'm not buying her like Prada bags and all this bullshit I'm not masking like my affection for her and like artificial goods effectively so a lot of our values are the exact same and none of them have adjusted so whether we had to whether we had to 
reduce our lifestyle or whether our lifestyle got even bigger and we built like a massive like villa in Asia, we'd still be the same people, right? Yeah. And where we are at the moment is like there's less like complexity. Uh, it's, it's just it's just keeping things very simple, right? And I think that comes from like a good position of like where you are structurally. You know, a good yeah. structured, well formed relationship is based on those premises versus here's my Rolex here's what I can do for you here's Dubai here's Miami I think like you attract the wrong person as a result yeah and as a result of attracting the wrong person you end up having the wrong you take the wrong actions so you know I interview many people and I have a lot of conversations with this recently how like you know you have that like basically like lifestyle inflation as an entrepreneur and I think like the fact that you can live like a king of 10k a month is like is, is hilarious right because that is the reality right i'm probably not that too shy off you to be honest including rent maybe not that too far off you mm. and the reality is like most guys who make 100k profit spend 90k a month yep. and it's like god knows what they spent it on right but they did <laughs> they rent they rented a yacht bought loads of chicks on the yacht and then the next month they're like jesus i need to make a rent and make another in the yacht this month and yeah yeah like they do have the skills to make the money fair enough but my argument on that is i think that they get caught in a perpetual loop and they take their actions for the wrong reasons to get to that goal. Whereby, like, for me, you know, I'm pretty chill, like, in terms of what I need to be happy yeah. and so on and so forth, right? And uh, I think my largest expense, similar to yourself, is, is probably food, you know? Um, just that's probably it, just probably food, uh, just because I don't cook. Everything's from a, a restaurant, everything's made for me, everything yeah. comes from a chef. And that, that's the only thing, which is very much a personal thing, to be honest. Yeah, it's like, I don't like one. Yeah, one of the things that I don't shy away from is overpaying for high quality foods, because I'm like, that's what my body is made of. Like, that's the fuel that fuels my brain. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to I don't want to cheap, cheap scope myself there. And, and you know, one last thing is like I noticed is like I got together with my girlfriend also many years ago. I had already made my first million at that point, but she didn't knew she didn't know because also I didn't my lifestyle wasn't reflective of that. I was still living in like a, a student apartment for like one K a month. It was like one room. Um, because I, I guess in my brain, it didn't click yet that I have money. And, and she knew I was a coach back then. I was a dating coach. And in her head, she's just like, who the fuck pays for a dating coach? Like this guy's probably broke as fuck. So <laughs> the first year she just assumed I was this broke guy and she, you know, and she fell in love with me, fortunately. And I think that's really important for guys like us to find a partner in an ideal world, you find a partner that you meet when you're still broke, because then you can always fall back to like, I know no matter what, my girlfriend's going to love me. There's not a shred of doubt in my brain of like, does she just kind of like me because it's a nice lifestyle that kind of gets financed? For the, you know what I mean? Like, no matter how good your quote unquote game is, I think there will always be this kind of doubt in your mind of like, does she love me? Or to what degree does she love me? And to what degree does she love being with me and the lifestyle that comes along with it? And in your case, you, you can tell it without a shred of doubt because you met your girlfriend when you were 5,000 in debt. And, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, a very, uh, it's a st source of stability for us, man. And it's a necessary source of stability because due to our nature, what we do, we don't have that much stability. Man, oh, you took the words out of my mouth. Like I said this to my, my parents recently, like I don't want like a fucking crazy lifestyle whereby like I'm in clubs, partying, out, brunches boozy drunk brunches all the shit i want to work on my business record a good podcast do this kind of stuff and then just chill right like after this podcast i'm gonna go for a walk nice. and then i'll come back actually i'm gonna go for a swim after this because it's so fucking hot i'm gonna nice. go for a walk and then after that i'll just do some podcast stuff and then i'll read and i'll go to bed right because i don't want all this like crazy fucking because i had that right and that's the thing is that in my early 20s i had a lot of that stuff and i can tell you that like yeah it's fun but you can't do it forever. And those people are the people that are actually probably broke, to be honest, yeah. and end up going in that circle continuously. My man, my man. Now, Derek, we've, we've talked for a really long time. We talked about a lot of good stuff. The last question that I had for you is, what do you want to be known for? I want to be known for someone who like follows the fundamentals and principles and doesn't do all the tricks and the hacks. Because I feel like everyone is just selling you like the tricks, the hacks, this process get here do this business and i feel like a very little people are walking you through like this is the fundamental shit this is the foundational stuff this is the stuff that will change your life effectively and it's not glitzy it's not glamoury 
And I know if I went down the other route, yeah, I could grow faster and get loads of attention. Da, da, da. But I feel like it's like not, nah, it's at odds to my values and who I am as an individual. And yes, you should work smart, but to work smart, you need to work incredibly hard. And by only working incredibly hard, can you work smart? And I feel like that our generation has just completely skipped this like hard work phase, which yeah. is why they get disgruntled when they see you and they see me and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And yeah, man, like, and like, I'm, I'm kind of dared to tell people that it's actually not going to be easy and maybe you don't even want to do it. That's, that's actually the honest, <laughs> the honest <laughs> truth, right? It's like, unlike you're like me or you, I'll be better off not doing it, right? Um, oh. And yeah, man, like I think that's that's a good way to be known for and just to have that high bar of uh, honesty and transparency. Yeah, I love that. You want to be known as the guy that works hard and gets shit done, not the guy that just got kind of fucking lucky, you know? It's beautifully said, man. Uh, yeah, dude, 100%. where... Where uh, where can people find you? How can they reach out to you? Just type in type in Darren Lee on Google, and if I didn't do a good job, you you won't be able to find me. But you should be able to find everything on page one of Google. If I didn't, I'm not working hard enough. <laughs> All right. Well, for the off chance that they don't can't find you on Google, I'll also put your Instagram uh, in the description down below on this podcast and all that Great jazz, fun. my man. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Enjoy your walk. Enjoy the swim. Um, we'll stay in touch. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, brother. I'll see you later. Whoo! What an awesome session here with Darren. What a great guy. What an inspiration. When you say, hey, I want to I wanna build something myself. I want to be my own boss. I want to start with entrepreneurship. Or maybe you are already an entrepreneur, but you're not there where you want to be. We can help you. We can help you get started. We can help you scale and automate. All you have to do is you head over to maxtorno.com forward slash call and book a free consultation call with me and my team directly. We will look at your business idea, what kind of skill, hobby, expertise, or passion you want to monetize. We'll be helping you monetize it further if you already have a business. Basically, if you're not making 500K a month yet, up to 500K, we can probably help you make more or get started as a coach or digital consultant. MaxTorno.com forward slash call and uh, talk to you very, very soon.